Okay. <clears throat> so this thing I'm teaching tonight um, is the predominant uh, idea that's the predominant supporting idea uh, around what we teach in our training cycle is what we call it. It's 24 trainings, teachings that we go through every six months. And basically uh, what it is, if it's a new believer, you know, we're establishing a foundation. If it's a believer that's been in church their whole life or even come out of, you know, a cult or a very, very, very religious church, um, it, it, the purpose is to lay a brand new foundation. And a lot of that stuff, I don't, I don't teach that stuff on this call, although I teach around it. You know, it's not, um, you know, most of the people on this call are on our, either in our Sunday gathering or uh, listen to it after the fact or watch it live. So I don't reteach those things here. I just, um, honestly, what I do in these sessions is I, um, I pray in tongues uh, and, and I, and I'll get, uh, a message from the Lord, so to speak. I'll get a, it, it, you know, some people call it a download. I don't know if you've heard that term before, but I'll pray in the Spirit, and then at some point the Holy Spirit will just release a whole uh, bunch of, a whole string of thoughts and scriptures together to me. Sometimes I feel like I deliver it really well. Sometimes I don't feel like I deliver it well. Uh, just depending on, you know, if I'm tired or my frame of mind. Um, but uh, this is the case today. I actually had something else planned and kind of, you know, a study. And um, I, w I spent a long time praying in tongues this morning. And then I came back home and sat down on my computer, began to work, and, and then just uh, just came like a, like you just dump a bucket of stuff out and it just came to me. So, uh, but this is not a new subject, but what I'm saying is that I'm relying on the Holy Spirit to uh, give me what you guys need, uh, because the point here is uh, that you grow into the manifestation of a mature Son of God. That is the point for your life. If you ever wonder what the will of God is for your life, or maybe you have conversations with other people and they're asking, you know, what does God want? In my life, what's what's his big will, his overarching will for my life? It is called sonship, and sonship looks like Jesus. Everything that God did through Jesus was to make you a son just like him. Um, in fact, everything that Jesus and you know some of the writers of the New Testament, especially Paul, Peter, and others, uh, everything that they taught and wrote about revolved mostly around manifesting the kingdom for the sake of the mission okay and people don't get that therefore they read or interpret the new testament through some other idea but the the new testament must be interpreted and read through the filter so to speak of god creating a new uh heavenly humanity that is in the likeness and image of Jesus Christ for a purpose. And that purpose, as Jesus states over and over and over and over, <laughs> is the kingdom of God on the earth. And even, I uh, go over this a lot, but I don't think I go over it too much because we've all had such a healthy dose of modern church that it's very easy to not get what I'm saying. Um, you know, this is... This is highlighted and, and preached by Jesus, even to the point when his disciples asked him, teach us how to pray. He went straight to the mission, which is, he said, pray like this, kingdom come, will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because everything that God is doing through his kingdom and through his new race of humanity in Christ, which are sons, not sinners, sons. Everything that he's doing through this humanity and through this kingdom is restoring righteousness back on the earth again. And in the process of that, we have several things happening. A couple of big things are, number one, setting the captives free. 
which Jesus mentioned specifically when he uh, got up to read out the, the uh, scroll of Isaiah. Um, one of the first things that we see Jesus doing, <clears throat> and he said that he was here to proclaim freedom for the captives. Okay, the captives are the uh, the hu is humanity that is in the line of the first Adam. They're stuck in sin, and they have no way out. They're condemned already. And Jesus is the way to be uh, born into a new family or a new line of humanity. And that's why Jesus is called the last Adam, which is an easy way to point out that God started over with Jesus. And Jesus is the first of a new righteous, holy race of sons. And the other thing that God's doing is destroying the works of his enemy. Now, he's already removed the authority or the dominion, as we teach, from the devil that the devil acquired illegally in the garden when he seduced Adam and Eve to, to rebel against God. And Jesus did that. And we know that because when he ascended into heaven, right before he left the earth, he said, Behold, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And so Jesus took back the dominion um this is a scripture I, I can't recall right now where exactly where it's at maybe hebrews 2 14 but jesus took back the one who held the dominion of death being the devil okay and so uh when he did that jesus became the lord of heaven and earth and that's important because when jesus ascended to assume his lordship from this throne of all authority and all dominion the bible says that we also ascended with him so we as new creation humans those who are born again filled with the holy spirit we're not just you know living here on the earth um randomly you know we're not just born again and just hanging out until whatever we are actually seated with Christ, ruling from his place of elevated uh, dominion and authority over all the earth. And God had to do this in order to bring his plan to pass. The problem was that man lost the dominion or the authority that God gave him. Remember in Genesis 126 and Genesis 128, which I think we went over recently, God uh, told his his new man and his new woman that he created, he told them, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion, have dominion. In other words, they had dominion over all things in the earth and under the earth and that flew in the air. They were to uh, rule it all, even in the case where an enemy like Satan was about to come. Uh, they had dominion over that too, only they did not operate in dominion, <laughs> obviously. They rebelled, and in that case, they lost dominion. I'm not going to go into all that because I think I just taught that recently. So God's plan to establish his kingdom on the earth um, is for that kingdom to be established with a new race of humanity called sons who are in the likeness of Jesus Christ, who have Jesus's authority, his power, his ability, his name, and that we would, through the through obeying his commands, uh, begin to subdue all the works of the devil, destroying all the works of the devil, and also uh, uniting all things in Christ on earth, including all nations. All right. So at some point, as the church just does its job, and hell cannot. The gates of hell will not even prevail against us as we do our job. We're going to see um, heaven and earth start to become one. We're going to see all nations start to come into Christ and become full-grown sons in his image. And we're going to see the uh, removal of the influence of death diminished greater and greater and greater and greater. See, if if let's just fast forward a little bit here. Um, and in time, in our minds, you know, in our imagination. Let's just fast forward a little bit here. 
and imagine, you know, thousands upon thousands of sons of God who are walking the earth and conducting themselves just like Jesus did when he was here. That's stupendous. <laughs> you think about it, okay? But that is the plan. Um, think about uh, the effect that would have in the world. You could, you're looking at cities where no sickness exists anymore. Because remember, God's plan is on earth as it is in heaven. His will, his righteousness, everything on earth as it is in heaven. And Jesus modeled this, of course, with his disciples. He sent them out often in pairs. And he said, in, in one instance, in Luke 10, he said, go into the cities uh, and heal the sick that are there. So they, they practice going in and eradicating sickness and disease from entire cities. In fact, um, in a couple places, it says that Jesus went into a region and the region brought all the sick to him. We're talking about thousands of people. And uh, he said that he healed them all. And so when Jesus went into a region, he actually left the region sickness and disease free. Okay? And that might seem like, wow, I've never really considered that or thought about that much before. But think about what John wrote in the end of the book of John, the Gospel of John, he said, if all the things that Jesus said and did were to be written down, the books of the world would not contain it. That's a lot of stuff. That's a lot of healed bodies. That's a lot of dead people raised. That's a lot of works of the kingdom, okay? And imagine if we had, again, going back to our imaginary scenario, which is the future uh, that's coming, we had thousands upon thousands of men and women who walked and operated in that authority because this is a matter of authority. That is going to remove the influence of the enemy. In fact, when we heal a body, what is that? We're removing the influence of death, right? What is sickness and disease? It's just a dose of death, right? Sickness and disease wants to kill you, <laughs> you know? <clears throat> Whether it's a cold or cancer, uh, its goal is to put you in the ground. And uh, so that is just a little dose of death. John G. Lake called it, uh, called it a dose of death. So none of these things exist without death. And that's why we have all dominion over death. Death is really the issue because through the sin of one man, death entered the world, Romans says. Okay, so that's Cassie. I like what you said because you said I was rebuking the spirit of death. That's exactly right. And many times that's how we minister. Uh, you know, it just flies out of our mouth. Spirit of death, leave. Right. So that's very good. <clears throat> so <clears throat> we've got our, our goal here. We've got our mission. We've got our plan. We know how God's going to accomplish it. We know what the future is going to begin to look like as more and more disciples are made who come into the measure of the stature of the fullness of Jesus Christ. And we know, as I said, that everything that Jesus and Paul and others taught in the New Testament revolves mostly around manifesting the kingdom for the sake of the mission, manifesting authority, manifesting dominion, okay? Um, and that we've got to read the New Testament through this lens. It is a mission to destroy the works of the devil, to subdue all of his enemies under his feet, and to unite all things in Christ, according to <clears throat> Ephesians 1.10. So even if you just get this, that that's enough. If you meditate on this and begin to speak it to yourself, that that's who you are, this is enough to get you going on the right road. Uh, but tonight, I want to actually dive into how you can uh, begin to enter this process uh, in a very practical and real way. Um, it's a little bit hard to teach, um, but we find it all over scripture and I'm going to do my best, but this is the thing that encapsulates all of our 24 teachings. Uh, <clears throat> without this, you're going to go, you're going to, you're going to see growth. You're going to see results, but this is going to get you, uh, uh, you know, get you results much quicker get you sustained uh, results <clears throat> and help you uh, just 
jump up uh, into really the experiential reality of what has already been placed in you. Okay, so before I do this, you have to know that we're not trying to become sons. We are sons, right? And maturing in Christ is not getting things that you haven't been given. Maturing in Christ is uh, utilizing and bringing into an experiential reality the things that have already been given to you. And the uh, picture we use in this is when a child is born, uh, they don't have much dexterity. You know, they they don't even realize they have fingers until they realize, hey, that that's seems nice to just begin to chew on. You know, the first thing they do is they find their fingers, they start chewing on them. Um, and then later, a few years down the road, they're able to play, you know, classical music if they practice. Classical music on the piano. Well, how did that happen? They didn't get more fingers. They didn't get different fingers. They developed the fingers that they were born with. And as a son, you are born with everything that you need to mature into the measure of the stature of his fullness. Now, if you, unless you really take hold of this and believe it, uh, it's going to stunt your growth because you're going to be waiting for something that you think God has yet to give you uh, regarding a son. Okay? So, I'm talking about uh, the baptism of power. I'm talking about dominion and authority. I'm talking about... Um, God's character and nature, all of these things that made up Jesus are how he has recreated us, all right? So this this is a, a journey into you, you, you and your mind becoming just like Jesus. Yep, Clara, the whole church has been waiting, and they've been waiting for a long, long time. <laughs> no more waiting. All right, let me read a couple of verses here just to back up the fact that we are to grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ. Again, you're going to have to renew your mind on this stuff. You're going to have to meditate on these things. Write these verses down. Meditate on them. You know, confess them out of your mouth. Speak them. Believe them. Uh, Luke 640 says, this is Jesus speaking, by the way, a pupil is not above the teacher. But everyone who has been completely equipped shall be as his teacher. Of course, Jesus is speaking of making disciples. Everyone that is equipped shall be as his teacher. So what's he telling them? Listen, guys, we are equipping you to become just like me. Uh, many scriptures Support this. I'm going to read a couple more, but one I didn't write down is First John, uh, speaking of us being a complete son. He said, "As he is, so are we in this world." That's present tense. As he is in his dominion, his authority, his power, his ability, so are we. Other scriptures like First um, uh, Corinthians chapter two, it says that we have. The mind of Christ, all right? Not he will give us the mind of Christ or he's giving us little by little the mind of Christ. It says we have the mind of Christ. All right. So we know that we're in Jesus's um, mind that that we, when equipped, will become just like him. All right. Now I'm going to go to Ephesians 4.11. This is the purpose of the uh, what we call the fivefold gifts, uh, the apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, evangelist. And it says in verse 11, he gave some on the one hand. This is the Weiss translation, by the way. And he gave some on the one hand as apostles and on the other hand as prophets. And still again, some as bringers of good news or evangelists. And finally, some as pastors who are also teachers. For the equipping, and there's that word, remember I just read it in Luke 640, everyone who has been completely equipped, and here's this word again, uh, for the equipping of the saints for ministering work with a view to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the experiential, full, and precise knowledge 
of the Son of God to a spiritually mature man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And I taught uh, a few weeks ago about this um, uh, finishing the construction. Uh, this is one of the verses that we use for that Greek word uh, for building up. It means to complete a structure. So we have a starting point and we have a finishing point, uh, we could say, which is called here a spiritually mature man. And then it defines the spiritually mature man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. All right. Uh, one more scripture, Romans 8, 19, says, For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, speaking of the devil, of course, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. Okay? So this, these scriptures are pointing to um, uh, illustrate God's plan that through the church or through the sons of God uh, who become mature, spiritually mature, or into the measure of his stature, of his fullness, that even the corruption that is on all creation would be lifted by, as it puts here, the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Okay? Now, none of this has to do with heaven. <laughs> we haven't even set foot in heaven here. We're talking about God's plan for the earth. And you, as a son of God, God's plan for you revolves around this life here on earth. And it revolves around us uh, setting up. All things free. I quoted that scripture a minute ago, Ephesians 1.10, to unite all things in Christ, in heaven, uh, things in heaven and things on earth. Listen, if things are united in Christ, they have obtained the freedom that is in Christ. And that is what we're going for. We're going to completely liberate not only humanity, but even all things that have experienced death. Death didn't just come on humans. It came on all creation, right? And death is going to be, uh, the influence of death is going to be removed, not just by Jesus, but by his church, okay? All right, now here's why I want to get to the practical stuff of how to begin to walk in this. You'll probably have to go back and listen to this later again to get this. But if some of you have already stepped into this, maybe by accident or whatever, you'll um, you'll remember if you have when I start talking, and then you'll be able to make a little connection. Okay? All right. Stick with me. Of course, if you have a question, just raise your hand or stop talking or, or whatever. I don't want to blow past any questions uh, because questions is how we learn. All right? So let me say these a few things. Most people only seek things out of their soul life. The decisions out of your soul life do not involve power. Okay? What are decisions we make out of our soul life? You know, I want to eat a McRib today. I want to go swimming today. I need to do laundry today, and I hate laundry. I saw you folding, Cassie. <laughs> you know, these uh, decisions made in our soul only are things that have to do with earth it has to do with just there's nothing of power in it it's just temporal things right all right when you seek something out of your spirit though that is when power gets involved and most people never learn to do anything out of their spirit because here's why 
they're carnally minded. They're they are carnal, sensual being, meaning they're ruled by their soul. They're ruled by their emotions. Uh, they're ruled by their personal desires. Uh, they're ruled by the things that they think in their mind. And Paul makes this comparison that we are not like those people. And he makes the comparison to people who are unbelievers, saying they're just led around by every thought that enters their mind. Okay? So when you seek something out of your spirit, this is when power gets involved. Now, it's important to understand that when you seek something with your spirit, your soul and your body will follow. Okay? But if you just live your life in your soul, then uh, your then the spirit is like low, 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 low uh, down, and it doesn't have any influence. Okay? So if you live as a carnal Christian, uh, someone who just you know, relies on their senses, like, um, this is an easy example uh, with healing. Um, you pray for someone, but you don't believe it happened until you see it with your eyes. That's a carnal, sensual Christian. A spiritual mind says, when I pray, it's done, no matter what my eyes see. You know, faith is not based on what we see. It's not by sight, right? It's not by senses, and that's what it means to be carnally minded. You're ruled by your senses. You know, whatever your senses tell you. You walk outside and it's cloudy. Some people, their whole day is shot. <laughs> that's a that's a sensual person. Um, anyway, I'm sure you guys have a hundred examples you can use on your own there. Uh, let me continue. <clears throat> Most people never go to the depth where their spirit is engaged. Some go there only by accident because of a traumatic experience. And some go there by an act of their will to accomplish a task or a goal that is beyond them. And in the past, when I talk about this, uh, I talk about uh, maybe athletes or uh, you know, professional athletes or Olympic athletes, Olympic runners, they, <clears throat> the ones that have this uh, determination and focus uh, that puts them, and this is what they call it in the uh, sports world, in the zone, they experience a heightened performance, <laughs> right? And you see like a basketball player and they get in the zone and they break scoring records like crazy. Well, what are they doing? If, if, you know, normal unbelievers have a spirit too. It's just their nature of their spirit is sin and they're cut off from God. Okay. There is no relationship with God there. There's no life in them. They are a fallen creature. Yeah, Claire, that's right. We're, going, we're getting ready to talk about mindset. So <clears throat> when you have a, even an unbeliever who sets themselves to climb Mount Everest, they're going to spend years in preparation. They're going to train. They're going to push their body to the limits. And they're going to achieve an impossible feat by, you know, climbing that mountain or doing whatever. Okay? Now, if you've ever experienced something like this, maybe you've experienced like a, um, um, a bump in your focus because you fasted a day or you experienced a strengthening in your mind uh, because you exercised some discipline um, uh, that, you know, caused you to have focus, then you already know a little bit what I'm talking about. Um, maybe a better example to illustrate this is when you have, you are unfocused, what do you feel like? <laughs> When your soul life is unfocused and it's just like your mind is out of control and uh, fear is working on this side of you and then you're overwhelmed by all the details of your life on this side and then that's when you just give up and lay on the couch and that could, some people, that cycle lasts for days or weeks or months, okay? Um, so, feral cats, speaking of your mind, is that what you're talking about, Claire? <laughs> 
That's right. That's right. We all used to have feral cat minds. <laughs> Maybe a few stray cats out there still, but we're going to get rid of that. <laughs> so, okay. As sons of God, though, we're not, ser we're not just serving the Lord with our soul life. And this is the word uh, in the Greek, suke, which uh, I'm going to read a couple of scriptures here that point that out. This is the word that has to do with your heart, your mind, your conscience, all of you that is uh, that makes up the visible part of you. Everything that we encounter um, uh, from you, that is your soul life. It's your emotions. It's it's your intent. It's your will. It's your conscience. It's your heart. It's all these things kind of wrapped up together. And the Weist translation translates the Greek word suke as soul life, soul hyphen life. Okay. So as sons of God, we are to live from and serve the Lord with our spirit, which requires the soul life to be in agreement. So if you have ever subdued your soul life so that your spirit can be engaged you begin to experience light in yourself, in your body. You begin to experience life in yourself. Yes, Cassie. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure you did, uh, because you changed your mindset, right? You changed your mindset to do that. So I'm sure you did, right? And so um, what I'm talking about is a continual, is walking in a continual mindset change. So you experienced a a spike or a, dis, or a first time kind of, I'm going, I've decided I'm going to make a decision about my future, and then we're going to go this way from now on. OK, that's that is what I'm talking about. Um, and, you know, anyone can do that. But I want to take it to a uh, more mature form uh, where we actually see from the word of God. Uh, the mindset and begin to uh, and begin to walk in that. So let me make this statement and to, to this is a cut to the chase statement. So if you don't get it now. Uh, maybe in a few minutes, it'll kind of click the most. Um, I think I even wrote this down. I've got, yeah, I got way too many pages of notes on this. This is my favorite thing because this is what wins. Here's the quickest way to walk in the spirit. Okay. Confession of the word of God with corresponding action. Okay. Now, a lot of people 
put together some action. Like you, Cassie, you put together that action and you felt like I'm, I'm in obedience and I'm making a mindset shift and a life change and I'm expectant. There's faith involved. And I'm sure we've all experienced those things. But the part that I want to bring into this, adding to that, is not just action. It's confession of the word of God with corresponding action. Or we can say this renewing of the mind with corresponding action is the fastest way to walk in the spirit. And when you put these two together, confession with corresponding action, that is the quickest way to cause your soul to open up or to come in line with uh, the spirit. I haven't explained some things yet, but you have to understand, we have to understand that your spirit is encased in a body and a soul, right? And carnal people never live from the spirit. We'll say carnal Christians, okay? Carnal Christians or even weak-minded Christians uh, uh, or Christians who have unrenewed minds to the word of God never live from their spirit. They only live as dictated by their soul. These are people that cannot control emotions. They cannot control their mood. They cannot control their mouth, <laughs> their tongue. They got. They cannot control their body. They have no control over their body. We had a woman that um, visited Sunday, and she was giving us her testimony about how she was addicted to food for decades, and that she'd just gotten victory over and was able to control her body. Okay? That's because she she mastered her soul or she got her soul into order. Uh, Haley and I talk about this. When we talk about it, we talk about bowing our soul life. Okay? So the difference between, I'm ahead of myself. I'm going to go back to where we were in a second. But the difference between a immature Christian and a measure of his stature Christian growing up into that uh, fullness is your ability to master your soul life. Now that includes renewing your mind and renewing your mind comes through the acknowledgement of truth. Um, uh, I want so much to go into that. I, I feel like if I do, I'm going to derail up the thing I want to say. But um, when we, when I say acknowledging the truth or renewing our mind, this is, um, this is something that's, going to have to come as a result of this focus that I'm getting ready to go over here. Um, when you begin to live out of your spirit, this means that you t that you begin to set your mind to apprehend uh, something that is out of your reach. Okay? Now, Clara, you were giving this, this testimony this morning about overcoming smoking and you had a victory. You, you got you you took you uh, took action. You took certain actions, and through those actions, you were able to uh, cause your soul to bow to your will. And then you said, "Hey, there was no craving today, or whatever uh, th this morning." Okay. Where do addictions live? They don't live in your spirit, especially if you're born again, right? They live in your soul life and in your mind. That's where strongholds are developed. Either good strongholds or bad strongholds. Strongholds of the enemy are developed in your mind. And you can see, I mean, I'm sure we've all experienced some degree of strongholds in our mind after we got born again and got free. Stronghold of uh, A stronghold of the Word of God, though, is where we're going with this. So when, we're, when we are... Uh, causing our soul life to come into focus. I'm going to keep using this even I, though I haven't defined it. Focus, what focus means. When we cause our soul life to come into focus so that our spirit can be engaged in something, uh, that happens through uh, confession of the Word of God with corresponding action. And that's what I mean by walking in the Spirit. Um, I told you guys this. Uh, a few times, but what I do every day is I set my, hey Siri, and you know I set a timer for an hour, or hour and a half, and I get up from my desk and I walk up to my mailbox and back, and I pray in tongues on the way of the mailbox. <laughs> I shouldn't have said, hey Siri, she's talking over there. Um, 
I, I walk to my mailbox, I pray in tongues, and on the way back, I confess things. I acknowledge things. And when I do that, woo, it's like it's like I am filled. My entire soul and body is filled with the Spirit. And um, this is what it means to be baptized in the Spirit, for that filling to overflow and even encapsulate you like a bubble. And that's what we uh, see when we read about the account where Peter... Uh, uh, was walking down the street on the way to the temple, and they put all the sick out on the sidewalks, hoping that his shadow would come across them and heal them. Well, it wasn't that Peter had a magical shadow. It's a baptism of the Holy Spirit that was uh, around him like a bubble. It was the it was the life of God that emanated from him that when it touched and came in contact with sick bodies, they were automatically healed. And we've heard many accounts even... Modern accounts, like with Smith Wigglesworth, they did that in Los Angeles on the way to the meeting. They laid out sick people uh, on the streets, and he walked by, and they were healed. And so this is the baptism of the Holy Spirit we're talking about. We're talking about walking in the Spirit, which means not being a soul, not being ruled by your soul life, but causing your spirit to uh, uh, be causing your spirit to rule your soul and your body, okay? So, um, what, let me give you a quick example before I go back to this other scripture where Jesus talks about this. I go to my mailbox, I'm praying in tongues, and on the way back, I start confessing things. And I have a bunch of things, different things I confess, but something it goes something like this would be one I confess often. I am a son of God. I am born again. Now, these are like really basic things, but we're talking about we're talking about settling this reality in ourselves. This is why church is so impotent because it's uh, it's the if they actually put on display and talked about the things that are true about them, people would laugh. You know, people would scoff and mock. And they're not willing to under, uh, go through that persecution, okay? But you, in order for you to settle it in yourself, to settle a truth about who you are in yourself to the point that you experience it in your life, you're going to have to say it out loud, and you're going to have to talk it out, and you're going to have to convince yourself. You're going to have to come to a new conclusion about who you are as a new creation, Okay? That's that's how you begin to believe things, right? I mean, there's sayings out there like this. You know, you heard it so many times, you started to believe it. Well, that's how we renew our mind. So, I am a son of God. I am born again. Okay, and then I'll say something like, "I am filled with all the fullness of the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God dwells in me in fullness." And then I'll say something like, and this spirit exerts full dominion over all the power of the enemy. And then I'll say something like, I have dominion over all the works of the enemy, over every demon and devil, over every sickness and disease. And then I'll say something like, and at my word, cancer dies. You see how we how I'm drawing a conclusion in my mind from start to finish because uh, I am preparing myself and staying ready to evict cancer every single time I speak to it because that's what Jesus did. He never failed and he never intends us to fail in healing or deliverance or ministering to people of in, in any way or any shape. Except we have to get it in our, we have to, uh, I need to teach this other part before I can talk about that. But I'll say something like this to strengthen myself even more. Um, I'll say, and, and this is all based on scripture, but for example, I'll say at, at my word cancer dies and then i'll say at my word cancer dies at my word cancer dies you hear the emphasis at my word cancer dies 
Um, and you can even do this with a scripture. And I'll do that several times. Uh, I'll say something. I'll go through a scripture like this. Um, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. And then I'll just emphasize, no weapon formed against me will prosper. No weapon will form against me, be formed against me, shall prosper. No weapon that is formed against me will prosper. You know, you just emphasize these different things and you're focusing on establishing and settling this in you. But you've got to uh, do it from a new place. Uh, you can't just, this is not just saying things out loud. You've got to do it from a, a place of determination that you will walk as Jesus walked. You've got to, let, and this is not a walk in the park. This is not a tiptoe through the tulip thing. Uh, I keep saying that on this call. It's kind of funny. This is not a casual, uh, you know, case or raw thing. You're going to have to somehow within yourself make a decision to limit yourself to this one thing, to take hold of this path that leads you into the full expression of Jesus Christ in your life. That, that you walk, talk, and conduct yourself like he conducted himself, and your mind is uh, his mind, it's renewed, and you are able to do the job of a son of God, because remember where this is all going. This this is all going towards all of his enemies under his feet. All the nations discipled, brought into Christ. <clears throat> Listen, you know the battle that's going on for your own life. Consider what the battle for nations is like. <laughs> Consider what the battle for a city is like. It's going to take nothing less than a mature son of God to pull it off. And you're going to have to find some kind of a holy desire that causes you to leave all things to take hold of this one thing, okay? It, this this is what I mean by uh, not doing something from your soul life. Like, listen, it, it was just January 1st. Maybe you decide, ah, I think I'm going to do a diet. And that, you know, that can be a serious commitment. Or maybe it was just like, ah, I feel bad about my weight so i'm going to think about doing a diet okay that's a soulish decision it's probably not going to last but let's say the doctor told you hey you're going to die in three months unless you shed 100 pounds between now and then okay now severity has kicked in now something that's caused that something causes you listen you get a thing like that spoken to you all of a sudden little little hindrances in your mind and your soul leave where do they go they, they were surpassed by a desire to live by a desire to not die your spirit got involved <clears throat> at that point okay and that that spirit your spirit getting involved at that point is the supply of power moving through you okay so through the fear of that doctor's report in this example <clears throat> you were able to overcome your mind that says i don't want to <laughs> you were able to overcome your flesh that says i don't want to and that is the same mind and the same flesh that you're going to deal with when it comes to walking this maturity out uh renewing your mind staying the course you know, confessing the word of God with corresponding action, drilling yourself over and over and over with the confession and the acknowledgement of the truth about you until it becomes so solidified and settled in you that you cannot help but to begin to go set people free and do the works of Jesus Christ. This is the way Jesus talked about it. In Matthew 6, 21, for where your treasure is, there also there will also be your heart. So he's talking about heart issues. He's talking about our soul life. Okay. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye be in single focus, pure sound, 
your whole body will be well lighted. But if your eye be diseased, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light which is in you is darkness, the darkness, how great. And then he's, he doesn't change the subject here, but he's kind of expounding. He says, verse 24, No one is able to be habitually serving two masters. Remember, we're talking about our soul life. For either he will hate the one, and the other one of a different kind he will love, or one he will hold to firmly as against the other, and the other one of a different kind he will disdain. Okay? He's talking about your soul life cannot to serve two masters. You cannot have two paths in your soul. You are not able, listen to what he says here, you are not able to be rendering a slave's obedience to God and to a passion for accumulating wealth. So uh, this is Matthew 6, 21 through 24, and this is the Weiss translation, so that's why it sounds a little extra. So Jesus eventually brings us into a, your soul life because he first he starts talking about where your treasure is there your heart is also. And then he ends it up with, you, you cannot render a slave's obedience to God and to a passion for accumulating wealth. So he's talking about, don't seek the treasure of this world, right? Seek the treasure that is above, but this is a soul life thing. Okay? It is normal uh, for us to start out with a soul life that does not want to pay the price that it takes to arrive at maturity. Okay? That's just where we start. It's normal for a baby to not be able to play the piano. They can just do a little bit. They can grab a hold of stuff. That's it. Okay? Now, we, though, as sons of God, have to, at some point, make a decision to be masters of our soul for the sake of attaining something that's already within us, that we are not yet manifesting. We have to come to this severe decision, this mental decision in our soul life, that we are going to submit our soul to walk in the reality of something that's already in us. <clears throat> and if you think about it <clears throat> in that light, it makes sense because God's not holding it back from us. It's not like we got to fast and pray for God to release something to us. We've already gone through all the verses that says that we've been made complete in Him. This is a matter of subduing our own soul life so that what is within us will begin to escape or manifest to the outside. And this has to do with, of course, mind renewal, which is that confession part I talked about, but also has to have corresponding action. You have to talk it, and then you have to go do it, and you have to pair those together over and over and over until it starts working, okay? Um, but you also have to settle it in your mind that your destination is nothing less than manifesting the kingdom of God in its authority, dominion, and power, just like Jesus did with the exact same results that Jesus had. That is our destination. You have to decide that that's where I'm going with this. Because if you have a different destination... Your soul, your unrenewed soul, your unrenewed mind is going to take you on a different course. Okay? And that's what Jesus is saying in this passage. Hey, if that, whatever your treasure is, if your treasure is, you know, just experiencing a few good things out of this life uh, from me and you're going to pursue something else, you know, your heart is going to lead you to that path. But if you decide to take my path, which 
ends at my result, then your soul it cannot be pursuing anything else. The eye that is single, that body will be filled with light. We're talking about focus, right? You ever had a big job to do and you, you're like, oh, we got to get focused here, right? This is the same thing I'm talking about. Only we're focused on uh, the part that has to do with our mind and our soul life coming into complete agreement with the mind of Christ and coming into complete agreement that allows our spirit to flow through it. Okay, let me read a couple things to maybe help illuminate this. If your soul life is unfocused, then it's in the way. And I'm talking about a radical, life-changing focus. I'm not talking about like, hey, what do you want to eat for dinner? Uh, let's think about it, pizza. I'm talking about a radical, I'm talking about a new destination, a new path, the whole thing. Unless you get this focus and keep it, you'll not be able to live from your spirit, okay? Living from your spirit empowers you to mature. It empowers you to manifest. When we manifest healing, uh, lay hands on the sick, we manifest in authority over sickness and disease, over demons and devils. That's coming from our spirit. Our spirit is one spirit with God. And the fullness of God is in there. <laughs> it is in there. And you have to come to terms with that. And then you have to decide at no, there is no thing that will ever prevent this fullness of God from manifesting when I desire it to anymore. That, that decision is going to be a decision from the place of your spirit, which overrules your carnal life. Listen, people's minds, I mean, Claire talked about the feral cats. Listen, it's, it's real. Put yourself in a dark room with no music and no lights and just get quiet and you're going to hear cats. <laughs> you're going to hear your mind processing things and you're not going to be able to pull the reins back. You're, it's just going to be like, whoa, I'm being taken for a ride by my mind. My mind is undisciplined. But if you begin to make a decision that you're going to manifest Jesus Christ in his fullness from your spirit that listen this is a this i can't i can't emphasize enough the level of decision i am going to do this okay you're going to hear all the voices in your head well who nobody else walks like this has has there any been anyone in history who walks like this i mean we see a few people in the bible jesus paul was pretty good peter yeah you you're going to look at your church your family your friends and you're going to realize nobody is doing this. But this is the job of the fivefold ministry to equip me to become it. Okay? This is about you taking ownership. In this company I work for, one of their, uh, their statements is, uh, own, own the impact. <laughs> That's good. Own the impact. If you want to take... Uh, responsibility for God's mission in the earth, you have got to personally own it. What do we mean by that? You have got to own the decisions in your life that cause your soul to come into submission so that your spirit can manifest Jesus Christ. Okay? When through the fruit of self-control you can achieve focus, in your soul life, it opens the way for the spirit life to flow out. So everybody's seen those uh, attachments on the garden hose. And if you if you twist it one way, the water shuts off. You twist it another way, and it opens up on the inside, and the water flows out freely. That's what focus is like. If you remember the old cameras before digital, they had a lens that you would focus. And it would change it would open and close on the inside. And when it, it and when you got it in focus, that's when 
things were clear. And that's exactly what Jesus is talking about when he says, when your eye is single, your whole body will be filled with light. Why do we have so many powerless Christians, powerless churches, not manifesting the authority and dominion of Jesus Christ? It's because they're focused on something else. It's because they're ruled in their soul life by things of this realm, by things of this world. And this is why Paul is always hammering things like put to death whatever is earthly in you. Why is he saying these things? Because he's saying get rid of these things because they bring uh, unfocus. They cause you, they prevent you from manifesting Jesus Christ. But if you get a focus, if you're, if the, if the, uh, if the entire desire of your life is pointed in one direction, I will manifest the dominion and authority of Jesus Christ to subdue the works of the devil, to set captives free, and I will do it at will. Then that decision right there will cause your life to be empowered by your spirit, and, it, and your spirit will overrule uh, 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 and give you power to keep focused, to stay focused. It's called self-control, uh, by the way. I just described it in a lot more flowery language. Okay, this is also what Jesus meant when he said, From your belly, rivers of living water will flow. Rivers of living water will flow from your inmost being. You begin to make a decision that I am going to do this. This is what we experienced before we started going door to door, or what I did, because I started by myself. I had one of these traumatic experiences in life, okay? And I had to focus or I was going to die. That's where I. That's what, how I discovered this stuff. And then Jesus started teaching me about it. And showed me his word. And then I heard other people teaching about it. And that's how it started for me. I found it by accident. But when I I was reduced to just moving forward in Christ with no other distractions, with no other options even, then power started flowing out of me. I didn't know what had happened. I didn't. What have we changed here, God? You know? What's happening? And then I began to realize, hey, I can live like this. I can live with this focus. I can live energized in my soul and my body. And I can walk in, even in health for my body because of this energy that's coming from my spirit. And it's not stopped in my soul. It passes right through my soul because my soul serves my spirit. My soul serves my spirit. My soul is submitted to the word of God. Okay? Um, this path is also called walking in the fullness of the spirit or walking in the spirit. The fullness of the spirit is when the life that is in your spirit is able to flow freely and fully through your focused soul life into your entire being and body. Um, let me give you a couple scripture references here, and then we'll uh, have to be done. This is what Jesus meant when he said, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Okay? This word seek is what I'm talking about. We're not seeking the kingdom of God because it's lost. Or it's out there somewhere, like God just chucks it in, you know, he chucks it out there. He's like, okay, go find it. No, no, no. We're talking about, we're talking about bringing our, we're talking about making a decision that we're going to go on a path, okay? And then we're going to bring our soul life into focus so that we can obtain it, all right? It's just like somebody who decides they're going to run a marathon. They have to have a mindset to do that. They have to have a mindset of endurance that they're going to stay the course. Uh, David Hogan um, has run like 55 marathons in the last eight or nine years. Do the math on that. 
He is he and he raises the dead and there's hardly anybody like him in the earth. But he has learned these things. Okay? So when it says seek first the kingdom, this is this Greek word uh zeteo. It means seek in order to find, to seek a thing, to seek in order to find out by thinking, meditating, reasoning, to inquire into, to seek after, seek for, aim at, strive after, uh, to demand, to crave, to demand something from someone. Do you see the a more colorful, full meaning behind seek the kingdom? Jesus is saying, bring yourself to bear in such a way for the kingdom that you begin to obtain it and manifest it. Remember, this is about manifesting the kingdom, manifesting authority, manifesting ability. To do the job of the mission. Um, I've, I've got a note here. I don't want to go deep into this. But this is the process a lot of times that we see in those who give birth to what we call revival. Revival is often preceded by a focused determination. Which is usually accompanied by repentance. To see something manifested. That is promised in the word of God. So how do we enter this? Repentance is the start. What are we repenting for? We're, we're turning. We're repenting. We're turning from a carnal soul, sensual or sense driven life into a spirit driven life. We determine to focus on one thing. That the kingdom of God would be manifested to free captives, destroy the works of the devil, and make disciples. Uh, one note here, and before I end on another scripture, one note here is that the manner in which this focus is often manifested is met with opposition from carnal people, <laughs> carnal Christians. It comes across as aggressive and uncaring to carnal Christians, okay? It is a common character characteristic, though, of pride to tear down others in order to defend yourself. So people are going to be offended by uh, the, the new man that is in you, offended by someone who lives like this, okay? It often comes with an aggression, okay? <laughs> Jesus was aggressive. He was compassionate and he also drove out devils he also made a whip and turned out over all the tables in the in the of the money changers he interrupted funerals to raise the dead he he rebuked his best friend and called him the devil oh my gosh okay so this is a great that comes across as aggressive and uncaring because living with this focus trains you to become soldier like and this is very scriptural. Paul even talked about Timothy uh, to uh, prepare yourself as a soldier. Become as a soldier in this because that is the right mindset. That is the right attitude. The Pharisees were famous for defending themselves. And they did that with Jesus. They tore Jesus down to defend their position. What was really happening? They were probably freaked out. <laughs> So the duplicity, the duplicity and the argument for being too aggressive is that the carnal person is not free themselves, nor are they able to set anyone else free. The world will not accept this kind of Christian that we're talking about, but all creation is crying out for them. OK, this is this is though God, the father slay, slayed his son, Jesus. So that we could have access to this path. Okay. The follower of Christ is only concerned with pleasing the father. And therefore will be able to naturally find their way to the manifestation of the kingdom. You get your soul life focused on, do, on following this path. 
and only pleasing the Father in your speech and your conduct, you're going to do well in this, okay? Um, I want to bring up one other scripture here, and then we'll be done. This is when Jesus, uh, he had a discourse here of a couple different verses. I just want to highlight uh, what he said, because this is what he's talking about. Then he said, this is Matthew 16, 24. Then said Jesus to his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Okay. This word deny uh, is Greek word 533. It means to disown, abstain. To affirm that one has no acquaintance or connection with someone. To forget one's self. To lose sight of oneself and one's interests. Okay? That's who Jesus was. He was only focused on manifesting the Father. He said, I, he said you look at me, you see the Father. You don't see Jesus and all the stuff that Jesus is about. You see me manifesting the Father, because I'm here to please for the Father. Please the Father. I always speak uh, for the Father. He spoke for someone else. This is the perfect picture of us. See, you begin to get this focus to obtain and walk in this. You're going to find yourself taking responsibility. And in turn, you begin to realize, I am speaking for someone else. I'm not speaking on my own behalf. I'm not speaking for my own benefit. I'm not speaking and sharing my own personal ideas. I am speaking. This is what authority speaking. This is what taking responsibility does. It causes you to operate in the authority of another. And that's what we're doing here. We're operating in the authority of another. Um, so that was Matthew 16, 25. Oh, no, 16, 24. This is Matthew 16, 25. He says, for whoever will save his life shall lose it, and whoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Jesus is explaining to us how to walk as a new creation, son of God, a mature son. He's given the example, and he's explained to us, here's how it's done. Whoever will save his life, this word save is sozo. It's Greek word 4982. It means to preserve, to save oneself. Okay? So whoever will save his life, let's uh, look at this word life. This is Greek word 5590. It means your soul, your life, your mind, your heart. Okay? This is, this is the Greek word suke that I was talking about earlier and is translated in the Weiss translation as soul life. Okay? So whoever will save his soul, life, mind, and heart for himself will lose it. <clears throat> Remember, we are disowning and, and abstaining from our own soul life. Because we're going to bring it into order so that we can live the spirit life. All right? <clears throat> All right, so we've got whoever saves his life will lose it, and whoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Let's look at this word lose. What about losing your suke, losing your soul life, putting your soul life in order for the service and purpose of living by your spirit, which is to manifest the kingdom of God at will. All right? So whoever will lose his life, let's look at this word lose. This is Greek word 622. Uh, it means to destroy fully. It means to perish, destroy, lose. To put out of the way entirely. Man, that's a good definition there. To put out of the way. Whoever will put out of the way entirely his life for my sake shall find it. To put an end to, ruin, render useless, kill, to declare that one must be put to death. So you get the picture there. You get the picture there, okay? 
So there, Paul is always talking about this stuff. And I mentioned one verse earlier where he said, put to death whatever is earthly in you. Why is Paul talking like that? Is he just mean, having a bad day? No. He, again, he is doing his job as a fivefold minister and apostle and teacher and several other, probably, he's probably operated all of them. He's doing his job. He is equipping the disciples to become like the master because anyone who is equipped will become like the master. He's equipping them to become like the master and he's telling them your soul life, put it to death so that you can be enlisted in the service of another to, to manifest the dominion that God has put in your spirit. Your spirit is the real you. And your spirit is one spirit with God. The, new, the real you, your spirit, your new man, it's really a blend of the Holy Spirit and your spirit. You've got a newly created righteous spirit with no sin. It's pure light. Now God joins himself to that new creation to make a brand new thing. This is the mystery of the husband and wife, by the way. Okay, they become one flesh. You become not one flesh with God, one spirit with God. 1 Corinthians 6, 17, he who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with the Lord. And this new being that is in you, which is a marriage of God's spirit and your spirit, uh, is what causes healing to happen, is what causes devils to flee, is what causes your words to be spirit and life. But none of those things will happen unless you bring your soul life into submission uh, by renewing your mind to be in complete agreement with the Word of God, by, uh, by becoming strong in your mind and not pulled around by emotions and, and details and distractions and causing yourself to live from your spirit that you would again arrive at a destination which is the measure of the stature of his fullness able to manifest all dominion, all ability, all power. Whatever we need to do or get the job done, we manifest it. Listen. It could include walking on water. We are able to manifest it. Hey, it could include walking through a wall. Able to manifest it. Hey, it could include multiplying food. Able to manifest it at will. These are the kinds of sons that the earth is crying out for because they have the they are God's arm in the earth for salvation, healing, and deliverance and restoration and this is the agent that God is has chosen from before the foundation of the world to bring heaven and earth together as one in Christ in his son I could talk all night and all day tomorrow and all night and all day tomorrow again about this because there's so much more to say and you know but we're going to have to end there. So is there any questions or thoughts or comments or you need to know what verse that was or uh, whatever? Or like, man, you lost me in the first sentence. <laughs> questions, comments, thoughts. Yep. This is what causes you to win. This is the attitude that we have when we go out on outreach. And you, it's aggressive, but you can be gentle with suffering people and also have aggression working right alongside it to destroy whatever needs to be destroyed or heal whatever needs to be healed.
<laughs> oh. Yeah. Yep. And here's a um, here's a, a important point to bring up. Uh, your soul life tends to take over or influence you more at those times when you're tired or you're worn out you like after work so you're gonna to have to develop some kind of routine or you help yourself you know get through those times right um, and and what you talked about is a great thing like um, put on a teaching put on something pray in tongues you know uh, praying in tongues is one of the best ways to do this but again we're not just we're not just praying we're not praying with our mind when we pray in tongues we're praying with our spirit that means we're praying towards an expectation we're praying through to manifest something we're praying through to overcome yeah yeah and when you begin to, uh, at first, when you start doing this, you're going to have little spikes. You're going to be like, ooh, ooh, there was a good spot. And then you'll be like, oh, it feels like I'm walking through mud. And then you'll have another spike where it's life. Uh, the more consistent you are with all these things, you're going to start to just go up and up and up and up like this. And then when you can walk in it like that kind of continually, I'm not saying it's it, it gets easier uh, because you still have to exercise discipline every day. Jesus said, take up your cross daily, right? Uh, but you'll be able to do things like heal the sick much more effortlessly, right? Instead of pushing and trying, you'll be able to lay hands on the sick. And uh, usually this is what we do, um, is we'll uh, command and break the power of whatever has bound them, right? Right? if it's cancer or whatever and then we'll put hands on them and just release a flood of life Whoa. just let it in pour pour in pour in so we break the power of the enemy if it's a spirit that's actually there or if we're just like cassie was talking about commanding death to leave and then we pour in life and that that life goes in and heals all the tissues and makes new organs or recreates eyes that are blind or whatever it needs to do but that flow is effortless. Remember in the Old Testament said uh, in, uh, I can't remember where, uh, but it's it's a real famous revival verse, verse. It's not by might, not by, pow by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And when you begin to uh, walk in this consistently with this kind of a focus, with this kind of a, uh, in this place where your soul life and your body are submitted to, your spirit and you're living and doing everything from your spirit hey you're going to be a super intense person you're going to be like aggressive and things but you're also going to be able to manifest the power and life of jesus christ in any situation very quickly very quickly even if it's just you overcoming a temptation right Yeah. Good. Listen, we're not trying to obtain something we don't already have. We are already a son. 
This is all in you. You just have to believe it. You have to believe it. <laughs> yep, you're going to have to begin to confess and acknowledge the truth about who you are consistently and several times a day. You're going to have to, just like a, an athlete, they're going to train morning, noon, and night. They're going to, this is all they're going to think about is training, training. Why? Because they're going to run away a race in order to win. Okay? That's the, what you're going to have to do with your mind. You have to start training your mind, and it's going to take discipline, and you're going to have to put some time and effort into it, and you're going to have to overcome some of those roadblocks that churchianity put in there, but you can do it. We all can do it. Uh, it, it is not only possible, but God commands us to do it, and the result is your entire life will be transformed. Did you know that this is the only verse that really promises that we will be transformed is Romans 12.2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And this is really what I'm talking about tonight. But people don't often put behind it this decision, this life-altering decision to take hold of the manifestation of Jesus Christ, to walk in fullness, to come to mature into the measure of the stature of his fullness. That's got to be your target. If it's not your target, you're going to arrive at a different destination. And it's going to look like churchianity. <laughs> right? If you want to... This may not be where you wanted your life to go. Okay? But, uh, again, talking about, you know, deny yourself, which means to completely abstain Put it, push it out of the way. This is what it means to take up your cross because now you are representing to the earth the authority of someone else who has sent you to do the job. Okay? So you don't get, we don't get any say in this. This is how we, this is who we've been made and this is how we operate. Now, at the same time, hey, we can bring our family up in this. You know, I'm not some preacher who sits back and collects offerings and lives on that. I have a full-time job. I talk to unbelievers every day. Hey, if I can do this in the full in a, just a normal life, we all can do it because we all just live in normal life, but we're sons of the living God. Any other thoughts or questions? Why is this your favorite subject, Haley? You want to share? You're still on? You're not coming through. Can you start over? That's true. That's true. Yeah, it's called the Jesus Path. <laughs> Anyone who wants to come after me on the Jesus Path. 
Uh, there's many, many other scriptures. Like once you start getting this and start reading the Word of God, um, there's other scriptures that point to this, like walk in the light as He is in the light. Um, uh, there's also another one that says that if we uh, walk in the light, then we have fellowship with one another and His blood cleanses us from all sins. Uh, you know, and like me and James... Uh, James is the one that I've got in my life that's been like this the longest. And James and I, of course, my wife, I'm just talking outside of my my immediate family. Uh, James and I have a fellowship that I don't really have with anyone else outside of my immediate family. It's because he's got this. He knows this and he walks in it. He knows when he's not walking in it and then he cracks and goes back, you know. Uh, you know, but this is the thing also. Um, this is this is the thing in Romans eight, uh, and in First uh, John, uh, where it says, um, "My uh, beloved, I pray that your uh, that you prosper and be in good health, even as your soul prospers." So when we do this work in our soul, what is a soul prospering? It's a mind that's renewed. And it's a mind and a soul life that is submitted and in order, which allows the spirit life to come through. That spirit life causes you to walk in divine health in your body. Uh, that is Romans 8 that says, uh, even though uh, our bodies may be mortal, that his spirit in us quickens our bodies to receive strength. Okay? Okay. So this is God's kind of like mature son way of walking in divine health. Uh, when your mind is in order, renewed, there's no hindrance, it's out of the way. Uh, your spirit is a continual, uh, it, it's continually manifesting the life of Jesus Christ. And that keeps your body well. That keeps your body well. Also, that's the same life that comes out when you lay hands on the sick. <laughs> we went to India. Uh, we we had we were on a heightened focus uh, because we didn't have a job to go to every day. Our job was to preach and heal the sick. And uh, James even noticed in his body that healing worked that whole eight days that we were there on that trip where he would have troubles just in going to work and having a normal life. He was living in elevated health. Because the, of the elevated focus, right? Am I right, James? Am I telling that right? So. All right. Well, if there's nothing else, we'll pray and uh, let you go. Kind of a long one tonight. But this is the thing that, as I was describing earlier, this is the thing that we really... Uh, that we really encapsulate all of our other teachings in, because unless you unless you have this focus going, your 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 growth is going to be very slow. And when your growth is slow, it's easy to be frustrated, and you're going to start second guessing yourself, and you're going to be like, "Why isn't it working?" Okay, we can teach topics on faith and all kinds of healing and all kinds of that stuff, and you will receive some benefit. But there is the benefit you receive from, this is called also dying to yourself, by the way. The benefit you receive from this level of focus that brings you into a mature sonship, it is, it, it is the thing that we have to take hold of. Or else um, we're going to be always kind of like, oh, this is hard, right? This is slow. When do we win? I w and I went for 20, like 20 years in normal Christianity until again, I went through that experience was like, I have to, I, I have to take hold of something that I am not even sure if it's there or I'm going to die. And I found it. I found him at the same time. I found authority and power. And then I saw all of a sudden started reading it in the word of God. So, all right, let's pray in Jesus name. This is why Paul is always, also, always praying these prayers like, 
And may you be strengthened with might according to his glorious power. Uh, you know, these prayers about being strengthened with might in your inner man, the spirit of might in your inner man. This is all about living from the spirit. This is all about causing your soul life to be renewed and come into agreement uh, for the sake of the new man that's in you. So, Father, I tried to explain this the best I can. Uh, it's your job to bring revelation and understanding. But most of all, we have to come to a place of decision where we would rather die than not walk this path that leads to the measure of the stature of his fullness. Father, we choose, I choose, to lay my life down that I might obtain one master. I want one master, and I want to walk in his fullness in order to please you, to be pleasing to you, to have fellowship with you, unbroken fellowship with you, and also that I could do the job that you have given us as sons to manifest the authority and dominion of the kingdom over everything that is uh, illegal and broken in this earth. That I could be a true representation of you, a true ambassador. That my words would be spirit and life. That at my word, cancer would die. That at my word, the dead would be raised. And that at, the, at my word, uh, hearts would be pierced with truth. Let a new people arise whose minds are renewed and untouched and unspotted by this world. A new people whose lives are blameless, spotless, and perfect in your sight. We choose this path and we choose to finish it in Jesus' name. All right, guys, go walk it out. We'll see you next week. Uh, if you ever have questions or anything, want to reach out to me. Uh, I think everybody here has either got my number or some messenger messaging thing to get a hold of me. Feel free. All right, folks. See you next week. Adios.